How many of you, I'm sure not very many of you, maybe none of you, remember a television game show from back in the late 50s? I think it aired from 1955 to 58. And it was one of those television game shows that was involved in the, uh, uh, the game show crime whatever they called it, they made a movie out of it called The Truman Show in more recent years. But there was a scandal that was going on that involved this particular show. And the name of the show, I never actually remember watching it, but it was called The $64,000 Question. The $64,000 Question. And of course the game show is based on the uh, format of contestants who would answer certain <laughs> questions. And if they got those questions right, they would become more difficult questions. And ultimately, if they got all the questions right and went to the uh, final round, they'd win $64,000. That was a big lump of money back in those days, in 1958. The $64,000 question. The thing that's impressive about the show to me was not the show itself, because as I said, I don't ever remember watching it. I was only been five years old with a pen so. I don't think I remember actually watching it. But we still talk about, to some extent, at least us old folks, about the $64,000 question. That's become an idiom or a, a colloquialism in our language that refers to the important thing or the tough question, the, the nut that can't be opened. What's the $64,000 question? Somebody asked in reference to... Uh, well, how do we solve poverty? Well, that's a $64,000 question. So it fits into that type of context. Well, we're not going to be talking about the $64,000 question, whatever it might be, in our sermon today. But we are going to be talking about a very important question, the most important question that anyone can ask. A question that was asked by many in the Word of God, and if you'd like to turn to Acts chapter 2 and read with me just a couple of verses there, it is a context in which the Apostle Peter, just a few short weeks after Jesus ascended into heaven following his death and resurrection, Peter was preaching in Jerusalem to a group of Jews who were gathered there. They were there to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. There were thousands of Jews there from all over the known world at the time. And as they were gathered there, there was a group within that midst of 120 disciples. The apostles were part of that group. And Jesus previously promised, as Acts chapter 1 points out, that he was going to send his Holy Spirit upon the apostles for the purpose of giving them the ability to speak by inspiration, that is miraculously, to teach the people the word of God. And this miraculous Revelation and a manifestation of God's Word lasted until the, as 1 Corinthians 13 points out, until the Word was finished, was completely revealed. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that when that time which is perfect has come, and in the context we realize that the time that's perfect that will come was a time when the Word of God would be completely revealed as it is to us today. And the imperfect or time that was in part was a time when the spiritual gifts had to be used to teach and edify because they didn't have the word, they did it through inspiration. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles and led them, as John chapters uh, 14 through 16 point out. So we don't have miracles today, but we do have the word. And we can read and study the word. Well, part of the word, as I mentioned, going to Acts chapter 2. Has Peter speaking to this group of Jews there in Jerusalem? And they were very religious. They were Jews. They believed in God. They followed the Old Testament. And in uh, chapter 2, Peter begins to preach his sermon. And the sermon basically was for the purpose of proving that Jesus was Christ, the Son of God. And toward the end of the recorded portion of his sermon, in verse 32 it says, as he's facing these Jews there, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, speaking of the apostles. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, 
And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he said himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Here he's quoted from the Old Testament, which these people truly knew well and believed in. And uh, David, as he says here, made a prophecy about Jesus, that his soul, that he would sit on the right hand of God, and that his enemies would be made a footstool. Then 36, he says, still speaking to these people, that a part of the crowd that clamored for the death of Jesus, crucifying, crucifying, they said. Some of these people were in that crowd that clamored for the death of Jesus. And then Peter says to them, Therefore, let all the house of Israel, that is the Jews, know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said, Peter, to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the question. Over in Acts chapter 16, where the Apostle Paul was teaching the Philippian jailer, he said, in more detail, what must I do to be saved? These people are asking, what must we do to be saved from having abetted the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? A fact that Jesus Peter had proved to them in his sermon, and they believed it. They were touched to the heart. They were emotionally affected by what he said. Then it moved them to ask, what shall we do then? That we're guilty of this sin. So he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit was everything the Holy Spirit provided for mankind the work of the inspired apostles, eventually the inspired word, and the work the Holy Spirit does through us today, guiding us through the word. Interpreting our prayers to God. So the work of the Holy Spirit does not involve miracles among Christians or among the world today. But the Holy Spirit is still alive and well, working in and through Christians to do God's will. That we might be able to do God's will. But the question is, the $64,000 question, if you please, the important question that these people ask because they found it necessary is the same question you and I need to ask today. Men and brethren, what shall we do? For as the Philippian Jaber said in Acts chapter 16, what must I do to be saved? That's the question. That's the important question. Every man and woman on the face of the earth needs to get to the point where they ask that question. How do we get to that point? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. These people here in Acts chapter 2 that Peter was speaking of, eventually 3,000 of them were baptized into Christ. They obeyed Christ. They became disciples and followers of Christ. But before they asked the question, what must I do to be saved, a question that was motivated by their faith, they had to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Their faith was evidenced by their question. You've convinced us that we put to death Jesus Christ on the cross. We believe that. We're convinced of it. Now what do we need to do? So they heard the sermon that Peter preached. <laughs> when we study the sermon of Peter here, we have the words written down. So a person today who is not a believer still needs to ask that question, still, still needs to find out what they need to do in order to be saved. But they won't find out until they study the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And that hearing is a hearing of the Word of God. We gain that through hearing a sermon, or sitting through a Bible class, or reading the Word of God. Many people have ended up converting themselves simply by reading the Scriptures. And I'll admit the Scriptures are not easy to read. The Bible is a difficult book in many cases. It's not easy, so it does take effort to figure it out, how it's divided up, how it's organized. Uh, you've got the Old Testament, the New Testament, You've got God's ancient people, Israel, in the Old Testament, and Christians in the New Testament. You've got 
commands given to individual people as to what they need to do individually. You've got commands given to the church as to what the church is to be doing as a local group of God's people such as we are today. So hearing is something that we can still do today by reading and studying and learning the Word of God. To convince us of the very same thing, it all boils down to one fact, that Jesus was the Son of God. That he proved by his miracles, by the fact that these apostles who were ready to give up everything when Jesus was put into that grave when he died on the cross, but they picked it all up again when they knew that he was resurrected from the dead. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for just a moment and read the first few verses here. 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul writes about this risen Christ. And just listen uh, along with me if you want to. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep, that means some have passed away. After that he was seen by James then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due season. Paul there referring to himself as an apostle of chosen last of the uh, twelve apostles. He says, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead was evidence by what Paul says here. They knew who Jesus was, they knew what he looked like. They saw him die on the cross. Some of them saw him being buried in the tomb, such as the women. And they saw him alive by virtue of his resurrection. On the first day of the week, Jesus came forth, three days after he'd been put in that grave. And the women saw him first. Then Peter and John saw him. Then all the apostles, they saw him. They saw the resurrected body of Christ. And Paul here testifies that he saw him too. We know that Paul saw the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him. And Jesus said, uh, that he was kicking against the pricks. That is, you're fighting against something, Paul, that you cannot stop. And he was eventually obedient to Jesus. He was convinced that Jesus was brought up because he saw the resurrected body of Christ there on the road to Damascus. Paul was a persecutor of the church. On the road to Damascus, what was he doing? He was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. He was dragging men and women out of their homes, out of their houses and throwing them in the prison, and putting them on trial, sometimes taking them down to Jerusalem, and putting them on trial, and if the uh, Sanhedrin found out that as Jews, they were not, they were, they had been, become obedient to Jesus, they were put to death. That's what the business Paul was in, crucifying Christ afresh, putting to death Christians, persecuting the church, seeking to destroy the, what he called on several occasions the way, that is Christianity, the cause of Christ. But he was convinced that Jesus, this highly educated, intelligent man, the Apostle Paul, who was a, a, a Pharisee among the Pharisees, he was accomplishing more than his peers in the study of the Jewish religion. He was going to be a great leader, like Emmanuel and some of the other famous Jewish leaders. But he was convinced that Jesus was the Son of God, and from that point on, he dedicated his life to teaching the gospel and proclaiming the gospel of salvation to anyone who would listen. But he taught the word of God, giving people an opportunity to hear. We have that same opportunity to hear the word of God. But then after we hear the word of God, we have to believe it. That's evidenced 
by all the different examples of conversion we have in the New Testament. The people in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 believed the message of Peter, that Jesus was the Son of God and had, risen, had been resurrected from the dead. And they became disciples. In Acts chapter 3, there were others, 2,000 more, who were converted to Christ, who believed that Jesus was the Son of God. In Acts chapter 8, the uh, Samaritans. Then in Acts chapter 8 again, the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 16, Lydia and her household, and the Philippian jailer. And uh, the 12 disciples there, who were disciples of John in Ephesus, in uh, Acts chapter 19, they, they believed in Christ. And uh, they heard the word of Christ. And there was evidence to convince themselves, as it is there for us today, that Jesus is truly the Son of God. Jesus is not with us today. We don't see him in the flesh. But once something has been proved, once a fact has been established, it doesn't have to be reproven with every generation. It's right here. Consider the evidence. There's all sorts of books out there describing and going into detail Describing the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, that he was indeed the Son of God. The fact that the Bible, after 2,000 years, going back to the Old Testament, 4,000 years, has never been defeated. Nobody's ever disproven that Jesus did not come forth from the grave. They started trying to disprove that <coughs> in the very beginning. Uh, the Jewish leaders put a... a uh, a group of soldiers at the tomb to make sure his body wasn't stolen and then the disciples could go back and claim, oh, he's resurrected from the dead because his, his uh, body is gone. Well, that fell through. That couldn't happen. But there was too many witnesses to the death of Jesus and then to his resurrection. And those are witnesses. The, the apostles, there's a very strong evidence of the deity of Jesus and the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. These men, common ordinary people, they were ready to give up. They were despondent when Jesus died on the cross, but if they realized he'd been resurrected from the dead, they devoted their lives to Christ. They went about teaching the word of God, and most of them, according to secular tradition, were put to death because of their faith. They died believing that Jesus was the Son of God. They could have avoided that by simply renouncing their faith, but they didn't. Why would they do that? The evidence convinced them that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. The Word is still living and powerful. Turn over to Acts chapter 4 and take a look at verse 12. It says, There is salvation, nor is there salvation in the other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We have the Word of God that's still able to convince us of the deity of Jesus. And if we don't believe that, there's no other alternative for salvation. We cannot be saved unless we obey Jesus Christ. The Word is still powerful, it's still strong, it's still able to convict people of their sins if they'll simply take the time to read it and study it and think about it. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. If we hear the word of God, if we're willing to believe it, if we're then willing to confess Jesus as our Savior, look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 beginning. He talks about, and he's talking directly to the people who are following him. He says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before our Father who is in heaven. For whoever denies me before him, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. When you hear the word of God, and you believe it, what do we believe? That Jesus, just like we read there in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died, was buried, was resurrected on the third day. That's what Paul taught. That's what all the apostles taught. When you believe that, you'll be motivated to confess Jesus as your Savior, as he says here. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father is in heaven. You confess your faith before men, I will, on your behalf, confess your faith before my Father in heaven. We have an example of that in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian, when he was being taught by Philip the Evangelist. He was teaching him about Christ. 
And at some point, as they were driving in their chariot across the desert roads of Gaza, there, in uh, southeastern uh, Israel, he said, here's water, what do you need for being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe, you may. He said, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so they stopped the chariot, they got down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And then the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. So he believed in Christ because of the gospel message that Philip had taught him. And based on that belief, he confessed Jesus. He confessed his faith that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's confessing we almost make yet today. Hearing the word of God, believing it, confessing Jesus, and then just like the Ethiopian, be baptized into the body of Christ. There in Acts chapter 2, we read where those 3,000 that Peter was speaking to, in verse 36 through 40, or 39 that we read, picking up in verse 40, it says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So baptism was part of their obedience to Jesus, to be, to be saved. We have to hear the word of God, obviously, and we have to believe it. Confessing Christ, repenting of our sins, and being baptized. That's what Peter said there in verse 38. When they asked, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Hearing the word of God, believing it, that Jesus was the Son of God, continues to be alive, God. Jesus is living and well and alive today. Confessing his name, being willing to repent of our sins, which simply means the word repent means to turn away from. If you're walking in one direction, the idea of repentance is turning around and walking in the other direction. To change your life. Repentance is a change of heart that results in a change of life. So you recognize that you are a sinner. What's a sinner? You say, well, I'm not a murderer. I don't go around killing people. I don't steal. I treat my wife and children with respect. I'm a good husband. I'm a good citizen. Uh, I'm not an evil person. Well, what sins do I have to repent of? Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, John, John chapter 3, rather, verse 16. John 3 and verse 16, a passage that you're very familiar with. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world and gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know that. To read verses 17 and 18. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now verse 18, listen carefully. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This says that to be lost, that is to be condemned, and that idea of condemnation is eternal condemnation. You simply have to live without believing in Jesus Christ. Read verse 18 again. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we have to believe in Jesus Christ to believe that if we are obedient to him. If we're not hearing the word of God, if we're not believing it, if we're not confessing Christ, then we're disobedient and we stand condemned. There are many examples of people who heard the word of God in the New Testament who were not evil people. They were not gross sinners. They were not Adolf Hitler's or Pol Pot or somebody like that or Jeffrey Dahmer. They were good, basically good people. But they sinned. Romans 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Children 
are not sinners. You know, a lot of religions baptize children. But they're the only people who say, they don't need to be baptized because they don't have any sin. Children, infants, own up to whatever we call the age of accountability. At some point, everybody must take responsibility for their sins. But infants and children have no sins. If the Word of God, as we've talked about so far, is being preached to people who have the capacity, the mental ability, the maturity to hear, to believe, to confess Christ, to repent of their sins, to be baptized into Christ. Children are not liable to do that. They have no need. Jesus said, in reference to little children, you pick a child up and put him in his lap on occasion, said, of such are the kingdom of heaven. Except a man be born again, or except a man be converted and become as a little child, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So children are the standard by which we measure ourselves. They're innocent. They have no sin. But everyone else, mature adults, have committed sin. <coughs> All have sinned upon the shoulders of the Lord God. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's really the gospel in a nutshell. That's really the facts of the gospel. The death of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. And uh, the fact that Jesus still lives, his gospel is still alive and well, and men are still amenable to the gospel of Christ. Because salvation of our eternal soul, your soul is never going to die. Your soul is going to live forever. Either in eternal damnation or in eternal life with Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29 points out there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. The unrighteous will go to eternal damnation, and the righteous will go to eternal life. What does the world offer us in reference to eternal life? Does the world offer us anything that, like what Jesus offers us? If we obey Christ, we have eternal life. The world offers nothing of the sort. The world cannot give you eternal life. The philosophies of the world, the rich people of the world, the wealthy, the powerful people of the world, the philosophies of the world, they have no plan of salvation. Only Jesus Christ does. And only those who are willing to hear the word of God, give it a listen, and then believe it, confess Jesus as your Savior, repent of your sins, and be baptized into Christ, then you are a Christian. Our responsibility is to continue on to be faithful. There's no doubt about that. Revelation tells us that we're to be faithful unto death in order to receive the crown of life. So there's a life of faithfulness. Baptism is just the beginning. It's not the end. But it's the beginning of a life that's lived in fellowship with Jesus Christ. With His power, with His companionship, with His strength, with His encouragement, with His example. We can be faithful unto death. And you see that eternal life that's promised to all people who are faithful. From now until the day that we die, we put our faith in that, and we can be assured of salvation. Are you saved? If not, we encourage you to think about the life that you face outside of salvation. Eternal condemnation is the only thing you have to look forward to, and that's not a very pretty sight. If you'd like to be saved, you have the opportunity to become a Christian yet this morning. We're going to stand and sing a song of invitation, a song of encouragement. If you'd like to become a Christian, become part of that group that is saved, that's in Jesus Christ, that has benefited from the shedding of His blood, who are now looking forward to heaven when this life is over. We encourage you to come as together we stand and as we sing this song of invitation.